Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out, John O'White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Emil Sayeg. Emil is CEO and president of Entirety, and we're going to find out about him and his story and a little bit about Entirety. Welcome to the podcast, Emil. Thank you so much. So first of all, tell us a bit about what you do and and tell us a bit about Entirety. Absolutely. Um, So um, I'm the CEO and president of Entirety, and um, Entirety is a cybersecurity 
uh, company that secures uh, applications uh, in the cloud. Uh, we're based here in Austin, Texas, but we have a presence uh, all over the world uh, with um, a presence in, um, um, in Canada, um, all over the US, in Europe, um, even Asia. So, um, you know, with the, with the rise in uh, cyber crime and cyber criminals, uh, we've been uh, staying busy over the last year. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, it's definitely a it's definitely an industry that is getting more and more deserved attention because I think it's uh, it has to be one of the most important and significant areas for every business to consider across all industries. Really, right now. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. It's a it's an existential threat for mm. many companies uh, because these uh, these hackers are. Uh, no longer um, individual hackers that are sitting in the basement of their parents' home and trying to hack. Now these are organizations that are backed by nation states that, that are doing it for profit and for a lot of money. And um, yeah. about uh, interesting statistic: about forty percent to sixty percent of businesses that get hacked and lose data end up never making it a year later. Like they will be out of business a year after the, the hack and loss of data. So, uh, so it's wow. exis existential threat for businesses and for investors and CEOs and uh, so on and so forth. Mm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, so let's, let's hear about you. I know our listeners will love to hear a bit of your story and I'd love to hear even going back to childhood, you know, like, uh, sure. what, is, what are some of the moments that you can remember that really shaped you becoming the person you are today, Emil? Absolutely. So um, I'm an immigrant to the United States. So I immigrated here uh, um, in my teens. Um, and uh, I grew up in the uh, country of Lebanon. Um, and uh, this was, you know, certainly during not a fun time um, in that country during the height of the Civil War. Um, so um, I left uh, my uh, native country and immigrated to the United States, um, uh, you know, during moments of high uncertainty and, um, and, and strife uh, uh, and left my parents uh, back there and whatnot. And I came here and uh, um, honestly uh, just uh, sought a new life, um, um, studied here, graduated, um, and then um, and then started working um, in the United States, which you know welcomed me very yeah. warmly and gave me tons of opportunities. So um, this is, I would say, a seminal moment in my in my in my life in my career. Um, uh, you know, that kind of put me um, uh, put everything in perspective after that point. Yeah, I can't think of a much bigger. Uh, move than than moving than moving countries like that. I uh, I know that um, obviously it would have been a life altering move in in every way. But specifically for Emil as the leader, you know, CEO and president now. As you look back on moving countries, was there anything about that experience in particular that you think has really shaped your leadership, or any sort of lessons that you learned from that season that really shape how you lead today? Absolutely. The most important lesson is that um, you can use every handicap to your advantage to motivate you. And, you know, when I got here, you know, I started from scratch. It wasn't my intent to um, immigrate circumstances uh, actually forced me to immigrate war and strife and whatnot. Um, so, you know, I got here and basically, um, you know, had to figure everything out from scratch. And, um, it, it was a blessing because um, I knew that um, um, never fear any obstacles, uh, never fear starting over, um, never fear, you know, playing uh, against the odds uh, um, and um, that with, with enough determination, uh, with enough uh, hard work, uh, with enough humility to learn, um, you know, you can, um, you can get to the destination that you desire. So, so the, I think I think mm. that's a big lesson, um, as as you well articulated. You know, it was a it was a big move. Um, definitely shaped uh, shaped my life. Yeah, it's uh, I I just so appreciate you sharing that story, and um, I I can't even imagine moving countries at that age. What well, once you were in the U.S., what did you do next? You know, what did the next few years, uh, you know, maybe the the first sort of jobs. What what were you doing for the next few years after that? 
Sure. So I was going to school, to college at the University of Texas in Austin, studied engineering. I was uh, worked my way through it. Um, but then I had a fantastic um, opportunity against all odds. Um, here's a uh, fresh immigrant um, to the country, um, just graduates mm. uh, from school. And I get a job in the very coveted city of Austin um, where I went to school. Um, yeah. Whereas most of my peers um, that you know were born here, went to high school here, um, had to get jobs outside of this, the co most coveted city of Austin um, <laughs> at the time. And uh, this is during a time where the economy was in a depression, actually. So I literally applied to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs and, um, and called. And at the time, fax, you know, there was no email and, you know, uh, very little internet. So, um, um, so and um, I got a fantastic um, job as an engineer in the, in the city of Austin with a company that some of your listeners would know um, by the name of WL Gore and Associates is the company that makes Gore-Tex, the Gore-Tex uh, jackets and all that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I got a position in their electronic products division as an engineer. And um, I got started there and, uh, you know, very quickly uh, earned my stripes. I actually ended up uh, obtaining nine patents um, in my tenure there for five years. And uh, um, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of leadership lessons in the, you know, from that company, frankly. Um, they have a very unconventional uh, management style where yeah. um, all the employees are associates. There are no titles, no hierarchy. Um, only for legal reasons, you would have a, you know, a, a, a location manager so that they can you know, represent um, that location uh, legally, but uh, wow. but in general, um, there were no titles and no hierarchy, and then leaders essentially proved themselves and rose um, to the occasion, depending on projects and depending on circumstances and whatnot. So, um, so at a very young age, um, I knew that uh, leadership was not something that somebody entitles you to or gives you something that is earned and something that um, is earned by the number of people that follow you and believe um, in your vision or at least in, um, in what you have to uh, bring to the table. So um, it was an extremely valuable lesson very early on. Yeah, that's, in, that's, uh, that's incredible. And that is a, wow, five patents. Um, uh, did you say five patents in five years? Um, actually nine patents. <laughs> no, so yeah, yeah. Nine patents in five years. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. wow. What a, what a first significant sort of role to, to really cut your teeth in. Um, and so in that role, were you managing people or were you more, uh, an inv individual contributor? Initially, um, was an individual contributor. Of course, I was an engineer out of school, um, you know, cut my teeth, um, in, um, in various engineering functions and, you know, very quickly, I had this concept uh, that I wanted to take to market. And fortunately, the company allowed um, such, you know, uh, such ideas to be taken to, to, to market, regardless of where you were at the totem pole. And, um, and as I took it to market, it started gaining acceptance. So certainly, I had to form a team um, so that we can take it to market as well as develop it and productize it. So it was kind of a almost kind of setting up your own company. So you had to have some um, production people as well as some um, uh, product management folks and engineers, and you know, so created this, this, this cell and took this product to market and had the fantastic opportunity to um, travel, you know, around the world, um, <laughs> something like 20, 25 countries to go and evangelize this new product, um, which was in the field of telecommunication. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, fantastic opportunity. So it's almost like you're working in this um, larger company, but you're almost getting to be an entrepreneur within a within a larger company structure. Exactly, and that actually that concept is what shaped the rest of my career. Whenever I could give that opportunity to others, I always did. Um, I always would fall in the concept, uh, follow the concept of creating small teams that are effective, that are singularly focused on um, on a mission and success so they can feel like they're running their own company uh, within a bigger company. Yeah, I love that. I love that philosophy. Uh, to be honest, I've seen, I've seen um, not that philosophy, but I've seen 
uh, entrepreneurial people a lot in in larger companies really get uh, stifled and really uh, bottlenecks and so what was it about that company and the way they um, you know structured things and what have you learned that you do now to I guess to get out of the way but at the same time you have to create boundaries because you're still you know um, so how, how do you do that like how can someone listening who wants to implement that manage that tension yeah that's a great question and um, I mean I encourage people to read about the W.L. Gore philosophy started in 1958 really uh, avant-garde and leaders in their in their field but you know in terms of boundaries um the thing that one always has to remember is that there are some decisions if we're all in this ship together and we wanted to drill a hole to do whatever um put, put a you know put up a picture or put a board um you know there are ways to drill above the water line above the water line decisions would not sink the ship you can you know drill a hole you know you know, put up your picture. And so, however, below the water line, that's when you sink the ship where everybody's, uh, and everybody's on that ship. So decisions need to be divided into, you know, are these decisions that would sink this collective ship that we're all in, which is the company or this group, um, or are they, look, uh, you got the freedom, go ahead and execute and go as fast as you can and, you know, figure it out. So, that concept is is really liberating to kind of divide up decisions where you can have you know perfect autonomy versus decisions that um, you would need to consult um, or inform others of. Yeah, that's genius. I've never heard of that analogy before. I, I love that idea of um, what's above what's above deck or above uh, sea level, what's below, and and if it's above, let people. Um, do you know let people make their own choices and and really give lots of freedom and if it's below then realize that needs more uh, process structure and and leadership that's um that's brilliant yeah it, it's shaped me i repeat it a lot of people that work with me um get tired of hearing it but it's <laughs> uh <laughs> no it's good i can <laughs> I, you know, I just said to someone yesterday <clears throat> when I was doing a coaching session and I said the point, uh, and, I, and I love this idea from Patrick Lanchoni. He talks about being every leader needs to be the CRO for your organization or your team, your department. Mm -hmm. The CRO is the chief reminding officer. And I, I literally said to this person yesterday, you know, when you, when you know, you're probably saying it enough or starting to say your vision, the key sort of values, philosophies is when people say, is when people actually turn to you and go, gee, we probably have heard that enough. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's, that's usually when you know, wow, I'm probably, so that probably just means, uh, Emil, that you're, you're probably saying it enough to really embed it. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, your point though, on the vision is, hmm. is something that is real from a leadership perspective, because I mean, the responsibility, so our responsibilities as leaders is to help help create that vision, um, and then you know, frankly, expedite everybody to go and deliver on that vision. And so you, it, repetition yeah. is extremely important um, when it comes to the company vision because I, you know, this is another thing is that if teams aren't fully aligned on that vision and everybody's like you know maybe you know one degree off here, five degrees off here. You know what you're going to get is actually pretty big divergence as things, you know, yes. kind of go forward, right? So as things go yep. forward, these teams are very divergent. So you got to make sure that, you know, um, on the vision, which is drilling below the waterline, you got to have mm. perfect alignment. Yeah, <laughs> I like that, and I like the ship analogy. It just made me think of. Um, this is why I love working with executive teams so much and leadership teams of um, larger organizations, also small businesses too. But when you're working with a larger organization, the thing I love about working with the exec team is if you think of the ship analogy, it's like, you know, we need to change course. And it's like above board, everyone sort of, um, you know, is leaning to one side and we're getting everyone to move to different locations and we're uh, sending out additional boats and attaching them with ropes to the ship to try to change it. And it's like, well, why don't we just adjust the rudder? And if we just make that tiny rudder change by a couple of degrees, everything happens seamlessly. And I feel like um, I've just taken your analogy and just, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've taken it in a good direction, but um, I like the idea that when you're with an exec team, 
that's why exactly what you just said, when you can get two degrees of alignment fixed at an executive leadership level, suddenly that's like moving the rudder. And it's, and I see so many people out there trying to pull ships in different directions and, and move everyone around and pulling their hair out. And it's like, if you could really fix and really address that slight rudder um, issue and change that by a couple of degrees, so much of um, these other things will be easier. They may not disappear, but they'll become a lot easier to solve. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. I love that. I love that idea. I'm going to uh, definitely use that above the above sea level, below sea level. That's brilliant. Um, so <laughs> I have to ask this because it's such so fascinating and I love ideas. Um, and it's a bit of a simplistic question, but <laughs> how do you practically day in, day out and job description, position description, leading a company like yours is, is not a small company. You know, you got, <laughs> there's a lot of people around the world in different, you know, in different locations. How do you day by day work out what's below sea level, what's above sea level? <laughs> like how, how do you do that practically? Sure. I mean, that's a fantastic, that's a fantastic question. So look, we have, we have goals um, that we set uh, that the leadership team gets together um, on a quarterly basis and examines, at least on a yearly basis, we have our plans and um, and then we roll down these, you know, objectives to each one of the teams. Um, when it comes to the company objectives, um, there, you know, there is very, there should be very little uh, flexibility in a given leader or even their manager to be able to change it or go against it. So I would say, the company objectives, the three or four big company objectives, um, should not be um, should be below the waterline or below sea level, as you say. Um, in terms of how they deliver on those, and then the individual functional objectives, those should be up to the functional leader discretion on how you know how these get changed or how these get modified, and so on and so forth. Um, so I would say that's kind of how I like to keep it and how to manage. Now, um, in terms, I always say on a quarterly basis, you know, we mm -hmm. have an opportunity to sit here and, you know, adjust and fine tune the company objectives if need be. Most of the time, you know, those are set for the, for the year, but we'll have an opportunity on a quarterly basis to come in and fine tune them, adjust them, um, so on and so forth. But, you know, none of us should go against them or none of us should go and change them essentially um, on a uh, function by function basis without consulting with all the others. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, how did you, how did you find, or how do you find that um, different in a larger scale compared to a, uh, you know, there might be a small business owner listening, who's got a small team, they're leading the team and there's six of them in the company. What, what are the differences? Obviously, you nailed it for a larger company. I think that's 100%. The thing I'm thinking is how do you do that in a smaller setting when, as someone put it on the podcast recently, so much of entrepreneurship and small business is about having plan A and then pivoting, 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 like you're always pivoting in a, in a small business. Have you, do you have any advice or any thoughts on, on what it looks like in a smaller setting for a leader? In, in my humble opinion, it's not much different because um, mm. it is so, it's so much more important actually for an entrepreneur yeah. once they have something that's working to stay the course. Um, and the tendency is to constantly pivot and you never find your groove. Um, that's, that's somewhat um, what, what, I, what I found with a, with a lot of entrepreneurs where the pivots are so huge and so quick just because they can that they miss an opportunity. So... I would say, the, you know, have a vision, have a vision of what you want, align the six people that you got in your company to what you need. And if there's tweaks that you need to be, make, uh, be making, make them on a regular basis, three months, six months, whatever works, but don't make them every day. Because if you're making them every day, you're never gonna, you're never gonna gain traction. It's, it's just gonna be, um, it's gonna be constant pivoting and, you know, kind of going in, in circles in a way. Yeah, that's great. I love that. That's a, that's a really good, really good point. Um, thank you for sharing that. That was great. That was great advice. So for you, you you have this role. You do nine patents in five years. Um, it's really where I, I'm guessing there would have been a sense of 
you know, I can do this. You sort of find your, you, you suddenly you're able to launch a product. It's almost like, like I said earlier, what I'm hearing is really a, a lot of experience that some people get as entrepreneurs. You really had that as an employee, you know, that real entrepreneurial as an associate um, experience, which set you up. What, what happened next in your career from there, Emil? Sure. Then I go work for big companies. Um, and, um, um, but then um, I got an opportunity to work for this uh, small company at the time, which was called Rackspace. Uh, and uh, they did not have a position open for me. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't looking even. Um, a friend of mine went to work over there. I went to check it out. And then it was love at first sight. Um, so I joined um, and very quickly um, start to um, launch and develop products similar to my experience at WL Gore. Um, and then I became the, uh, the vice president of products for that company. The company is growing at a very fast pace um, at that time. And then we go public in, um, in 2008. And um, that was a wonderful event. Wow. Um, but, um, but, you know, it doesn't stop there. Um, here I am. I'm the vice president of product. Um, you know, certainly the company's success was uh, for all to see. Um, our products are doing extremely well in the market. We're very competitive. And then there is this, you want to talk about a pivot, then there's this massive um, um, trend that starts. It starts to kind of trickle in, um, which was the cloud um, led by this book company at the time called Amazon. And that became a threat to Rackspace. I identified it early and uh, I figured out a game plan to counter it uh, for for the company that I was working on. And so I go um, present that to the leadership team, to the board. It involved some acquisitions. It was a you know, um, pretty interesting uh, plan. Um, and they said, look, uh, that's fine. We can, um, we can do that. Um, however, you have to leave your job as the head of product and go lead that division that you're proposing. Because again, as I told you in the beginning of the podcast, I had this infatuation with creating small autonomous teams that acted like small businesses within a big business. So, um, so I left this um, job of mine, or vice president of product, which I thought I was going to retire doing, right? Being a, a, um, a vice president of product, designing new products, and went became a GM of a business, uh, of a small business that had <laughs> you know, very little revenue to none. Yeah, and um, and um, grew it to close to hundred million dollars in two years. Um, you know, fantastic success, a lot of wow. fun. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that was you know that was that was kind of what set me up to become a CEO. Um, that GM, that general manager opportunity, where I had to, had the full PNO accountability, a team of diverse functions, all the functions probably except with the exception of HR and finance, uh, every function that you would have in a company and running it and growing it at such a fast pace really fully equipped me to be a, uh, uh, a, a CEO. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's incredible. What a, uh, that's, that's just a fantastic <laughs> summary of what must have been such an exciting and, and full of challenges a uh, few years, but some amazing, amazing outcomes. And um and so as you sort of fast forward through your career since then and with what you're doing now, are there any moments that really stand out to you as, as pivotal for you, uh, you know, throughout your career now that you've been, now that you are a CEO, you've been doing what you're doing for, for a long time. Are there any moments that really stand out or are really particularly meaningful for you as a CEO? Absolutely. Never fear again. Um, you can, I mean, people that have good intentions, that um, work hard, um, that are reasonably smart, can you know figure things out. And uh, you know, for me, um, you know, when I joined Cadero, when I joined Hostway as CEO, and then merged Hostway and Hosting and formed Entirety again as CEO, um, there were moments where things didn't look um, as they may have seen at first blush, uh, harder than they um, um, than, um, they were at least positioned or um, shown at first. Um, so never fear, plow forward. If you have a good strategy, um, if you have a good plan, if you believe in the plan, 
um, you know, rally the team behind you and, um, and, and, and keep plowing uh, because, um, um, because it's easy. There's a lot of people. The difference between a leader and, um, and uh, that's successful and leaders that are not is, uh, is being afraid of the first obstacle and, and giving mm. up too soon. Yeah, I think you're so right. That's why I love what John Maxwell says when he talks about uh, consistency and intentionality. And I feel like uh, if you flip them around, you really talked a lot about being intentional and that's those quarterly or annual meetings. Like let's be incredibly intentional to set a very clear direction and make sure we're completely aligned. But you're right. What so many of, um, I, I think so many people, it's like that, that picture or that cartoon of the, of the guy in the cave, you know, sort of knocking away for gold who turns around and he was only like, it's such a lame cliched sort of cartoon, but it's, it's true. If you just consistency, I feel like really can unlock breakthrough and can unlock that next level that sometimes isn't far away. If you'll just stick with the intentional strategy you you've come up with. Exactly. Your story is incredible. I, I feel like I could ask another 20 questions. I, instead, what I might do is invite you back down the track, Emil, and, and maybe we can do another episode because I so loved hearing the analogy of the boat and, and your your career and your story is so rich. I'm really not doing it justice in a, in a short um, a short episode. So maybe down the track, we could do another episode uh, and, and zoom in on, on some uh, another part of your sort of leadership philosophy. Um, so the invitation's there for you. Thank you. It will be an honor and a privilege. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So let's let's uh, land today by doing Leadership Express. I've got a bunch of questions. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. Firstly, uh, and you can mention more than one. That's right. Based on what we said before we clicked record. But <laughs> what's a book that you've gifted to others? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, that one I would give to lots of my leadership teams. Yeah. How good is that book? Stephen Covey, just uh, it's uh, you think you think it's good, and you move on to something else, and then you see something, and you go, "Wait, where have I heard that?" And you go back to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's my experience, anyway. It's such a good book. Yep. Great, great exactly. recommendation. Um, now, any great podcasts, or it could be other things you're reading, watching, listening to books, anything at the moment you're really enjoying taking in. Absolutely. There's a book I really enjoy. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, reading lately is the trillion dollar coach by Bill Campbell. Mm. Um, um, it is a, it, it is the life of this uh, amazing human being who passed away since, but it's, uh, it's written by the people he mentored, um, which are all the leaders of all the big um, who's who companies out there. And um, they, written this book in terms of his leadership wow. uh, lessons uh, that they've learned from him over the years through um, walking around, being consulted to them, and then, you know, <laughs> um, creating these trillion dollar companies, um, uh, the trillion dollar valuations in Silicon Valley. So um, amazing book. Um, yeah, I would highly, um, highly also advise uh, folks to read it. Yeah. Wow. I love that idea. And what a beautiful legacy that that um all those people that he's you know really influenced have written have written the book about his life and about his uh his leadership lessons yeah that's sort of the ultimate uh the ultimate testament to someone who's who's really just led exceptionally well and and um i think there's no there's not much higher in terms of like a calling as a leader than to do what he obviously did that's that's incredible i'll definitely be checking that out that's amazing uh, what about a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or been reminded of? Um, so for me, uh, it's, it's something that has to do with me is, um, you know, not to be effusive in, in praise, um, not, not because people will not think that you're um, insincere um, or, or this and that. that's not, that's not the reason it, it could be even unhelpful um, to somebody that would think, that um, their capabilities are higher than they, they, they actually are. So um, I've learned to kind of be very measured um, as, a, as a leader um, in terms of my praise and being very factual. Um, I'm an emotional person and, you know, I just mm. always want to tell people, <laughs> you know, how amazing they are or how great of a job, but I've learned that that's not always 
super helpful um, and um, you know to be a lot more measured in in, in my phrase so it's it's kind of a mm. very um, I would say counterintuitive uh, counterintuitive lesson yeah that's that's really good and, and really interesting and um, the thing that that makes me think of as you share that is how many high performers, really great people that you want to work with the sort of people that you, you become uh, you just, you can really be on those sort of teams where you're championship teams, where you're really doing things that are just way more than what any of you could have done on your own. I think they want, people want to be challenged and um, it's that authentic like pushing each other, but in the best way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but I, yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's a really interesting mm-hmm. lesson and, and a good Yeah, thought. another word, what you said is be authentic in your praise. Uh, don't be yes. abusive. And, and, um, and that's, that's the lesson I had to, I, I had to relearn. Yeah. Mm. Are you, uh, I don't know if you're a, a sport or basketball fan, but have you seen the Michael Jordan, uh, oh, what's it called? The, the documentary about Michael Jordan and um, uh, his sort of career. Uh, uh, last Dance, The Last Dance. Have you seen that? I have not, but that's on my list now. So yeah, you should. The reason I mention it is it's so funny. I, I find it funny is a weird word, but I find it so hilarious. It's a similar thing with Steve Jobs. The, uh, the biography by Walter Isaacson of Steve Jobs has a similar humor to it for me, which is these these guys that just what I what I found fascinating about Michael Jordan is these teammates. They talk about him and they just one of the things I love about his impact he had on people is there's this sort of like um, grind and he probably almost takes it too far, right? But he he pushes, but because of like he pushes his teammates and Steve Jobs pushed people too. And it's so interesting how people sort of talk about it like, oh man, he was so intense. And yet at the same time, they'll be like, but that was that was the best team I was ever a part of. And that was the best season I ever played. And that that sort of um, paradox is really fascinating because people are like, man, he was crazy. He would just be so intense in practice, like, and he'd push us so hard and um, and it was horrible and it was awesome. <laughs> it's like all in one. That's awesome. Yeah, I will definitely, definitely watch it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's such a good uh, documentary. It's fantastic. Okay, what is a great piece of advice you've received, Emil? Advice that I've received? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I would say, um, you know, hire, hiring for attitude and then um, training for skill. Um, you know, a lot of time, you know, at least early in my career, you know, you needed to kind of, get people with a certain degree, certain certifications. And, um, you know, that's one, you know, one piece of great advice that I've received. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. Thank you for passing that on. What's a big struggle or problem leaders are facing when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so cybersecurity today is not the way it was before the pandemic or you know two years ago. Um, mm. It is a completely different ballgame, completely different ballgame. I cannot emphasize that enough for your um, listeners. Um, and uh, the, the issue is that um, folks are still treating it um, like it's a, um, it's a threat that they can manage around and whatnot. It's no longer um, for a... IT department to be able to uh, defend against. Um, it's much bigger than a single IT department. It's much bigger than um, um, a uh, small technical team um, because the threats, like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, is coming from nations, from organizations that are criminal, but are backed in many cases by nation states with lots of resources. And these ransoms are. Uh, the ransomware attacks that are happening yeah. are literally crippling companies. So that's the big, mm-hmm. is the change in mindset of, um, uh, and, and their posture in terms of going um, against these uh, cybersecurity threats. There needs to be a change in mindset in, um, in the corporate world uh, and small businesses as well on how to defend against these cybersecurity threats that are coming in. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and and I love having these conversations because that's not something I would have put two and two together 
without hearing you talk about it. Like it makes sense now you mention it, but I hadn't really thought of how someone who's invested in cybersecurity four years ago to some extent and gone, great, okay, we did that, we're sort of good, may may actually uh, a lot of the times need to realize, well, you need to review that um, and you need to probably constantly be reviewing that, I would imagine, because it's such a fast moving, changing landscape at the best of times, let alone what you've said, which is that the actual type of type of attacks and type of people behind it has changed, which would mean I, I'm guessing your whole strategies in how to protect would have had to uh, change and you'd have to be adapting incredibly fast. Exactly. You, you know it. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and I, like I said at the start, I truly believe that what you're doing is, um, I, I can't really think of a more important, significant sort of threat to um, to a lot of leaders than than cybersecurity right now. From that existential that and that number is uh, sitting with me about forty something percent of organisations who get hit often don't survive a year after. Incredible. Um, and we will in a moment find out how people can contact you. <laughs> <laughs> and, get, and get some help for that, which is always good. Uh, what about a movie or TV show? I told you about The Last Dance, but do you have any favorite? It doesn't have to have a big leadership impact. I've had people mention Golden Girls, Seinfeld, Seinfeld. Yes, Seinfeld. Seinfeld. I have a hard time not quoting Seinfeld, um, you know, at least once every other day. Um, I, I write for <laughs> Forbes. Uh, I write for Forbes about cybersecurity, and I don't know how I was able to bring Seinfeld into the cybersecurity uh, discussion. So um, I wrote two articles, um, one around Festivus and the other one around Vandalay Industries. <laughs> um, so I'm um, literally <laughs> looking at good. The, I, <laughs> So I've, I've, I'm looking at the whole, I constantly look at the whole world through Seinfeld just because it's funny and it's, it's a show about nothing and it's about normal people that face <laughs> different, um, different events in their lives. And uh, yeah, and I'm that generation, I guess. One of my favorite things to do when I'm doing a workshop with, um, with anyone, let's be honest, because I just use it as often as I can, but a workshop that has anything to do with teams and accountability is my favorite clip to show at a point when I might have, you know, everyone's, you know, just needs a moment to sort of think of something different than Jono's voice or, or workshop is to have that moment where Kramer, I play that clip where Kramer has walked into a place and they, they've assumed he worked there and they've given him, they've just assumed he worked there and started giving him work to do. And mm -hmm. typical Kramer, he just goes along with it and starts um, turning up every day. And finally he gets called into the boss's office and there's this line, which I just, that's why I play this so often, but the, the boss says to him, look, Kramer, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. And Kramer says, but I don't even, I don't even work here. We're here. And mm -hmm. the boss says, that's what makes this so hard. Exactly. <laughs> I'm letting you go, even though you don't even you technically don't work, work here. here. Exactly. <laughs> so Seinfeld. Yeah. I'm a big Seinfeld fan. I, I love it. Um, any others? Do you have any other favorite movies or, or TV shows that have really impacted you? It, this is an excuse for me to just get some great recommendations. And it's always a bit of fun hearing what leaders of all different places in the world enjoy watching. Sure. I mean, getting into cybersecurity, like the war games, you know, 1984, yeah. 1985. I don't know if you remember that movie, but, you know, mm. that's something that always, you know, um, um, you know, kind of, you know, I thought about how the world is going to evolve and, um, and, um, and, you know, it was the first, it was the first movie about, um, about hacking that, uh, that stayed with me um, all, mm. all this time. So, um, um, you know, that, that, that is a, you know, excellent movie. Um, um, yeah. War yeah. games from about from yeah. the eighties. Fantastic. I, I love recommendations like that. I, I can't remember if I've seen that. So I'll have to go and check it out. I do enjoy watching. Um, yeah. I just, I just love watching. Uh, I've had so many interesting recommendations through this podcast. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, okay. A quote I've got to ask, do you have a favorite Seinfeld quote? Oh, Seinfeld quote. Um, I have a Yoda quote. Um, oh yeah. 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 You. yeah. I, I love a Yoda, Yoda quote. Yeah. It's um, do or do not. There's no try. I love that. Um, yeah, that's good. You know, there's just no no try. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, because, I mean, I even tell that to my kids. It's like, well, I'm going to try to do this. Like, no, no, no. You know, just do or do not. There's no try. Just do it. <laughs> you know, it's that intention. Intentionality that we talked about. So, yeah. <laughs> Yoda, I love a good. I had um, someone uh, the other day was talking Star Trek, and we've got Seinfeld, Yoda. Uh, it's amazing what we can bring in, just like in your Forbes articles. It's amazing what we can get into a, a leadership podcast. I love it. What about a, a tip for finding and keeping great talent? Absolutely. Number one is um, you have to. Um, just like we talked about, the, the tip that was given me is, is you know, hiring for, for talent and then you educate them for skills and help them, you know, gain those skills. Um, I think the best uh, advice and the best thing that we can do as leaders is create a farm team um, in our companies where we're bringing people at the first level and uh, give them opportunities to grow. And that becomes the bloodline of the of the company, right? That's where future leaders will come from. That's where future technical leaders, but you know, that takes, you know, that takes patience. Um, and um, it, you know, it, it takes patience, but uh, the best, we have employees that have been with the company for 20 years, even some more. And uh, those are the current leaders that we're leaning on. These are mm. the um, folks that keep uh, everything together. And um, and these leaders don't have to be in the senior leadership level, but they're, you know, your middle management, they're your directors, and um, mm. um, and uh, they've they've gone up through the ranks and um, have proved themselves, uh, believe in the company, they're loyal, um, and um, so I know it's counterintuitive uh, loyalty um, and kind of creating that loyalty. Um, now that people are just jumping ship, you know, um, every couple of years, but, um, uh, I would say that's also the role of the leader is to create that farm team, um, mm. where every employee can find their future in the company. They can find a career path, building a career path for those folks as soon as they start in. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and, and I completely agree. And, and I think you, you also raised a great point, which is if you're going to allow people to grow, you're going to have to allow people to make mistakes. And I think we love the idea of growth. As someone said, we love the, we love change, but we hate transition. And it's like, we, we love the idea of growth, but we hate the idea of having to deal with mistakes. And it's like, well, you can't have one without the other. Um, or another great quote I've heard is you can have growth. Um, you can growth, you can have growth or control, but you can't have both. And this idea that you've got, if you want to create that, you're going to have to get used to a bit of mess and a bit and some mistakes and dealing with it, but you're going to create a culture that's going to raise great leaders um, and, and bring up that bloodline, like you said, that's going to be the future of the company. So yeah, really good thoughts there, Emil. Thank you. Okay. What is the best thing that you're doing uh, as a leader in your company, like just any current strategies or any current things that you're doing that you're like, oh, other leaders should know about this. Um, so for, for me, um, identifying and grooming leaders for the future um, is like one of my biggest functions in the company. Um, I go around, I mentor a bunch of people in the company um, at all levels um, and, um, and mentorship um, with those folks, it can be as, um, you know, I would say mundane as, Hey, um, I have a problem in my email replies. People view me as terse and we sit down and rewrite some of their emails where they're viewed as terse or, yeah. um, I want to, um, what do I need to do to essentially, um, do this job or that job? And we sit down and, you know, we go through. Um, a career planning exercise that they then they can go and um, and ratify with their with their direct manager, um, just kind of help them you know learn how how to formulate these things and what would be um, in their best interest and in interest of the company. And I always say you know you have to find your magic zone and your magic zone is the intersection. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine three circles, three circles, yep. you know one of them is what is it that you are the best in the world at. Um, the second thing would be, what do you love to do, right? Mm, Absolutely yeah. love to do. So the intersection of these two things. And then the third one 
is what is someone willing to pay you for? What is the company willing to pay you for, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, because you could be excellent at building sandcastles, right? And you could also yeah. love building sandcastles. But, you know, nobody's willing to pay you more than, you know, $20, $30 a day for that, right? So <laughs> that's not going to sustain your lifestyle. That's not going to sustain your life. So you have to, you know, that's a hobby, right? So what you need to find is something that you love to do, that you're the mm. best in the world at, that somebody's willing to pay you for. And then you're in your magic zone and then you're unstoppable, right? Then, then the sky's the limit. That's so good. And, you know, as you unpack that, it made me think of Andre Agassi. And he has a wonderful uh, autobiography called Open. I think it's called Open. Uh, the tennis player, Andre Agassi. And, and mm -hmm. you made me think of him because I had never put this link together until now, but he was literally the best in the world at tennis. And he was literally getting paid millions of dollars. And yet, and he talks about this in the book, he hated it. He deeply hated tennis. And it's interesting because he had, he had two of those three, but was missing the one about being passionate and loving what you're doing. Um, and it's so interesting that, that those three ideas work together. Even if you, if you take one out, any one of those three out, you, you, you've got a missing link. Um, and, and I read that and it blows my mind. I can't fathom that. Cause I think, how can you be the number one tennis player in the world be earning millions of dollars and yet hate tennis? And, mm -hmm. but, he, but he does. And, um, and he did. And it's, uh, it, it's such a, it, it's just excruciating to read this guy who is just winning championships, but just hating what he was doing. Yeah. Hmm. It, it... Sorry, you go. Sorry. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. No, no, no I'm, I'm agreeing. Yeah. No, I mean, my, my thing is that there's so many people that, that hate their jobs and therefore, yes. therefore, at some point, they're not going to be good at it, and um, um, so you have to find you have to find that groove um, where mm. you love what you're doing, and um, and you're very good at it, and somebody's willing to pay you for it. It's just a, that compromise of these three things, and once once you operate in that compromise zone in that middle zone, then honestly, the sky is the limit. You know, you've achieved that work life balance that you're looking for. Yeah, that's good. Did you call it the magic zone? Uh, yes, the magic zone. Yeah, I like that. So if you could only, this is the last question, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Don't jump around um, and be grounded in everlasting values, not fads. There's a lot of management fads. Um, there's mm. a lot of... Um, I would say things that will come and go. Um, but what we've talked about today um, are everlasting, well-grounded principles um, that, uh, that haven't changed in, in, um, in years. Now, there are certain mm -hmm. things that will change. We have to be open to, to change, certainly. Um, but, uh, but certain management principles are grounded in, in, um, in values. They're grounded in um, in, um, in principles that have been around for a long time and how people deal with each other and what motivates people. Um, so be, be a grounded leader, be a principled leader. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, thank you for sharing that. I love that grounded principle focus on the things avoid, uh, focusing too much on the fads, focus on the, on the things that will be sustained and, and long lasting. Um, well, I want to, uh, I want to find out actually, before I finish up, where can people find you if they've been listening, they go, Oh my goodness, I need to get in touch with Emil and entirety about, um, cybersecurity, or they might just want to look you up in terms of some of your Forbes articles or LinkedIn. What, what's the best way for people to find you and your company online, Emil? Of course, um, on LinkedIn, it's Emil um, Saig um, on LinkedIn, S-A-Y-E-G-H, and Emil is E-M-I-L. Um, on Twitter, it's E, uh, S-A-Y-E-G-H, uh, on, on Twitter. And then, uh, of course, if you want to email me, you're welcome to as well. It's my first name, E-M-I-L dot S-A-Y-E-G-H at entirety.com, and entirety spelled N-T-I-R-E-T-Y. So um, would Brilliant. love to hear from your listeners. Uh, happy to help them with uh, managing
managerial advice, leadership, um, cybersecurity, you name it. Yeah, thank you, Emil. That's very kind. Um, and I was actually thinking, <clears throat> as we sort of wrap up, uh, I wonder how many, um, I, I reckon there's going to be a lot of people in the next week or two in a meeting or in a when they're mentoring someone else or in a conversation is going to be saying, you know what, uh, I heard recently this idea of how um, you know leadership. It's like a it's like a boat, and the things above the above the sea level. Like I just loved that so much. I think suddenly all of our listeners are becoming um, are, are going to be sailing sort of sailors for the next uh, little bit in our leadership. That's that's definitely stuck with me. I'm I'm 100 using that um, that I got from Emil Saig. That was fantastic. A great picture. Um, thank you to our listeners for for joining us. This has been just so much fun and and really wise. I'm, I'm just uh, I really love today. I've learned I've learned a lot from Emil, and um, I want to encourage our listeners. I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast, where I give you tips on casting vision, building high performance teams, um, how to you know marketing, and how do you as a leader, how do you invest in business development, sales, all sorts of things, and also the Leadership Question of the Day podcast. You can check that out too. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to Emil for sharing so vulnerably, telling your story. Uh, starting off as, uh, you know, with that incredible story of how you moved countries from Lebanon to America and, and just, uh, yeah, just a, a really beautiful story telling us about your life and, and great leadership lessons as well. This, this will help a lot of people. And uh, I really appreciate your generosity with your time, Emil. Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you so much to you and to all your listeners. And hopefully we'll talk soon. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders and you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much 
that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself, and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it, and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.